So, Father, I thank you that you are perfect in all of your ways. And I thank you that you're perfect to us. And I thank you that you're a good, good Father. And, Father, I confess just at the start of the sermon that I feel utterly unworthy and incapable of preaching on Romans chapter 8. But, Jesus, you are worthy and you are capable. So, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, would you preach the message to us this morning? And I invite you to use me, um, use us. Thank you, Lord God, that um, you make your home in us. That's pretty good news. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Uh, last week, um, and if you weren't here, you just need to know we had a guest preacher, pretty cool. The Apostle Paul was a preacher last week. And he shared uh, his story, commented on Romans chapter 7 and 8, and he borrowed my tent, and he, he left it here on, on the stage. I thought his message actually was rather thought-provoking, and uh, actually uh, addressed, expressed some ideas that I've been chewing on for quite some time. Decades ago in college, uh, I think, you know, trying to be spiritual, I uh, memorized Romans chapter 8, and to be honest, it's haunted me now for about 40 years. Most commentators seem to think that the book of Romans um, is like a legal argument, that in the book, Paul is making a legal argument to explain how, indivi how individuals are justified or condemned, and, and so then the commentaries pick apart Romans in order to obtain knowledge that you can use to prepare yourself for the day of judgment. I mean, your day in court, it's coming, right? And I think that's all kind of ironic because Paul clearly states in Romans that no one will be justified, declared right, by works of the, of the law. And if we pay attention, I think we'll see that even though he talks about the law, all of the talk is in the context of painting a picture. And the picture is a story. It's a story that the entire Bible is, uh, is telling. So to me, Romans 8 appears to be a legal argument against legal arguments, and a picture more personal, passionate, and existential than any court case that you or I could ever imagine. And I think that's why Paul borrowed my tent on Easter and set it up and started talking about the inner tent inside of an outer tent that has become like a stone temple. As he said, um, this tent that he borrowed from me is the tent that I used to go camping with in, in my dad, with my dad. Um, outside the tent, I felt like I was never enough. But inside the tent, I, I, that thought just didn't occur to me, and so I would fall into this just delicious sleep, this rest, Sabbath, if you will. Outside the tent, I was constantly occupied with what had been and what might be, but inside the tent, I was perfectly content with just now. Outside the tent, I was always trying to be me, but felt like I couldn't be me, and always wondered, uh, who is me, why is me, and what's wrong with me? But inside the tent, uh, next to my dad, listening to his stories, I just am who I am. I'm home. Now, it's important to note that not all fathers are good fathers, and so bad things have happened in tents with fathers, but I'm just telling you that our Heavenly Father is a good father. He's the best of all fathers. So if we're terrified of his tent, it may not be because he's evil and we're good, but just the opposite. He's absolutely good. And in his presence, all evil is destroyed, like shadows destroyed by light, like lies are exposed by the, destroyed, exposed and destroyed by the presence of truth, like pride is dissolved by grace and fear is consumed by love. Well, last week, uh, Paul told us that when he wrote that we are the temple, he told us that he meant we are the temple, both individually temples and then 
corporately a, a temple. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, we learn that we're going to be somehow one enormous, ginormous temple. But right now, each of us has a physical body and a psychic body that's like this, like this old stone church, that's like this old stone temple built in 1920, built with human hands. He said that this old stone building is like our old man, our old Adam, this picture that I've shown you a gazillion times. It's the me that I think I create by taking knowledge of good and evil in order to judge myself and then create myself in the image of God. Old me is built with faith in Mises. <laughs> That's the belief that I am, Peter Hyatt, is salvation, which is a lie. So uh, he's a, a false self, actually a dead and empty self. Paul referred to him as the tupas, you'll remember, back in chapter 5. And in chapter 9, I think he's going to refer to him as a vessel of wrath. But in the depths of this old stone temple, there is an inner tabernacle or a, a tent, and it's actually not built with hands. It's eternal, and in it, everything is good, and it is finished. I think he would call this the, the new man, or the me that God creates. Not the me built with disobedience, my disobedience, but the me built with God's mercy. It's built with the faith of Jesus and is actually somehow incredibly the body of Jesus. And so Paul wrote this to the Galatians saying, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Well, last week, Paul claimed that this inner tent is what he was picturing when he wrote Romans 7.22. Listen, I delight with, and, and the verb is clearly delight with, but he doesn't say exactly who. I delight with someone in the law, or perhaps uh, with the living law in my inmost man. In Romans 1.18, you might remember he wrote this. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That's what the wrath is revealed against, okay? The unrighteousness, the ungodliness of men who imprison the truth in the chains of their own unrighteousness. So maybe Paul delights with the truth who is Jesus in his inner man. And Paul and the truth... Uh, Paul and the truth were somehow or are somehow imprisoned in Paul's outer man, his ego. So he's saying something like this. I delight with the truth in my inner man, my inner being, my innermost self, but I see in my members another law waging war with the law or the way of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. So his new man is imprisoned in his, his old man, which I would suppose would look something like this. Almost if I were pregnant with myself. And, and so he asks, who will deliver me from myself? Who will deliver me from myself, this body of death? Now those are just some interesting observations, okay, when you consider that Jesus said to Nicodemus, the Pharisee, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, you must be born again, anothen, or born from above, or begotten from above. Whatever the case, Paul claims that there is a war being waged by his flesh against his spirit, his old man against his new man. Remember, we were talking about that. A, a war between his outer temple and the inner sanctuary in which he delights with the truth. And I think that's kind of where we all live, right? <laughs> Somewhere between those, those two. And so we've been asking this question. How do I get from the old man to the new man? How do I enter his rest? How do I live by grace through faith? How do I walk like Jesus? How do I live from the innermost tent? That's the struggle expressed in Romans 7. Then Paul writes Romans 8. And so I, I want to read Romans 8 asking these questions. How do we 
connect these dots? Because there's a lot of dots in Romans. What is the picture that Paul's painting and what does it, what does it all mean? So Romans chapter eight, verse one, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In all sincerity, I think that is the most recited verse in Peter Hyatt's brain over the span of his lifetime. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, most recited. And, and yet I don't think there's any verse in all of Scripture that has filled me with um, such hope and at the same time such confusion and even abject terror. First, the hope. The reason for the hope is rather obvious, right? Can you imagine the freedom that you would experience in a place where there is no condemnation whatsoever? Freedom. Where would you go? What would you do? How would you live? Hope and then confusion. If there were really no condemnation, I'm not sure that I would even recognize me. The reason I don't drive 90 miles an hour on 6th Avenue, because believe me, I, I would, because I, I like driving fast. The, the reason I don't is I don't want to be condemned. Believe it or not, the reason I dress the way I do, I use the words I use, take a bath, wash my hair, is that I don't want to be condemned. The reason I worked so hard at school was that I wanted to justify myself with A's so I wouldn't be condemned with D's and, and F's. The reason I start writing a sermon on Tuesday is fear of being condemned on Sunday. Judgment Day! It's coming! That's the reason I, I begin writing. Well, if someone says, who are you? Tell me about yourself. You know what I do is I share justifications, which are all a ways, they're all ways that I have avoided condemnations. And my condemnation of others is often my justification of me. If everyone got an A, I wouldn't bother bragging about my GPA. Apparently, condemnation tells me who I am. Condemnation of others and maybe even condemnation of myself. Ever since about, 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 about kindergarten, it seems like my world has been defined by condemnation for the sake of justification. In other words, it's been all about blame. Our society runs on condemnation and blame. You're not a Democrat if you don't condemn Republicans, and you're not much of a Republican if you don't blame the Democrats, right? That's the way it seems. If there were no condemnation, you'd probably, well, you'd probably be maimed or dead within a few hours because someone will have clubbered you on the head outside the church and taken your purse or your, or your wallet. Our society, our world, literally runs on condemnation. And religion provides maximum condemnation, doesn't it? it it's useful that way. I remember picking teams for baseball in second grade, terrified that I'd be picked last and so be condemned. And just hoping against hope that Matt or Duncan would be picked last and so condemned. And I suppose that's when I started to wonder if that's how people got into heaven and other people got into hell. Ironically, I, I worried so much about condemnation that when I, I did play baseball, I almost always struck out. And once playing basketball, I even scored for the wrong team. My mind was so focused on myself, I couldn't focus on the ball. And actually, I probably couldn't focus at all. Just a couple years ago, Dr. Marisa Kruger, sitting right back there, checked my eyes, and then she said to me, Hey, Peter, when you were younger, did you have trouble hitting baseballs and shooting baskets? I was honestly so embarrassed I wanted to lie. And I said, yeah, I suppose. And then she said, well, that's because you have depth perception issues and you've needed corrective glasses your entire life. I remember my first thought was, you mean I don't have to hate myself? I wonder if I would even recognize myself if I, if I didn't condemn myself. 
And would I recognize anyone else if there were no condemnations? And maybe everyone needs, maybe everyone needs corrective glasses. Maybe everyone needs corrective hearing aids. Maybe everyone needs corrective willpower and corrective faith and corrective hope and corrective love. And, and maybe we're to provide the correctives for one another. So one person is a hitter, another person is a catcher, another person is a pitcher, and together we're just like an incredible team. I'm just saying that all my life I've been preparing myself for some sort of judgment day, my day in court. And so any stress, any failure, any suffering makes me fear condemnation. And so I begin to condemn in the hopes that somehow maybe I can justify. In other words, I seize control. I woke up around 3 a.m. on Thursday morning with Romans 8.1 running through my head. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then I had this thought. You know, I condemn myself quite a bit. In fact, I realized that I actually try to justify myself by condemning myself. As if I could beat God and everyone else to the punch and then maybe they would justify me because of my profound humility if I don't have something to condemn in me, I'll find something to condemn in me, all in a desperate attempt to justify me, which is an obsession with me and the very opposite of humility. <laughs> but that realization at 3.10 a.m. on Thursday morning is just more condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I started condemning myself for condemning myself, which is like, you know, just a swirling vortex of condemnation and self at 3.11 a.m. And then all of a sudden it occurred to me, holy crap, I'm not in Christ Jesus. For there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And the vortex of condemnation just turned into like a tornado of condemnation. But then I thought, well, what is not in Christ Jesus? Colossians 1. In him all things were created. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So if I'm not in Christ Jesus, maybe I don't even exist, and I certainly cannot hold it together. And that's kind of a little terrifying. And I can't stop condemning myself or condemning myself by condemning myself. So what do I do? I condemn myself. And Judgment Day is coming. Sunday is coming. And I'm to preach a sermon on no condemnation in Christ Jesus when I am a raging vortex of condemnation. So anyway, I'm just making the point that the statement there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus can be so thrilling and so confusing and then downright terrifying and then utterly condemning. I literally just wanted to die. So around 3.30 a.m., I just had to cry out, Dad! <laughs> Father, Dad, help me. Well, anyway, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law, the way of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, has set you free from the law of the sin and of the death. You know, God said the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is the day that you, you take the law and you start to judge yourself. The day you eat of it, and this is the quote, dying, you will die. Verse three, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned the sin in the flesh. How exactly that works is a topic of great debate and discussion uh, among theologians. And according to Paul, the answer is beyond our ability to even comprehend. But this much is clear. Jesus condemned my vortex of condemnation. The sin in the flesh is my desire to take knowledge of good and evil and judge myself so I can justify myself and condemn myself and everyone around me, maybe even God. You see, it's not okay to condemn yourself. It's not okay. 
And now I could tell you some absolutely terrifying stories involving demonic and satanic oppression. I could, I could freak you out, but, but I won't. I could tell you about how those stories and how evil inhabits condemnation, which is unforgiveness. So just believe me, evil does inhabit condemnation, which is unforgiveness. In fact, unforgiveness is the unforgivable sin. It means that you can't be saved from condemnation until you have stopped condemning which would mean that the last judgment in space and time is the moment you stop judging and surrender to the eternal judgment of God, which is forgiveness. Nicodemus, you must forgive. You must be born from above. That's the eternal judgment of God. It's called grace. God condemned all our condemnation in Christ Jesus. As Paul told us last week, the crucifixion of Jesus reveals that all of our self-righteousness just crucified the righteousness of God, which is uh, infinitely unrighteous. And I hope you see that Easter is the ultimate condemnation of all our condemnations. This one you have to really think about a while, but with every sin, I judge that the life, and Jesus is the life, with every sin I judge that the life must die so that I may live, but with the resurrection of Jesus, God judges that my judgments must die so that all can live the life, who is Jesus the Christ, the judgment of God. On Friday, I condemned the judge. And on Easter, the judge condemned all my condemnations. <laughs> Said, sorry, we're going to rise from the dead. It's not only bizarre in light of what Paul writes in Romans, but sometimes Christians, Christians of all people, have sometimes argued that Jesus was judged so that we wouldn't be judged. And they'll argue that Jesus was condemned so that we will never be condemned. And Jesus died so that we would not die. But Paul seems to think that Jesus was judged so that we'd all be judged by judging him. And that Jesus was condemned so we'd all be condemned by condemning him. And Jesus died so we'd all die in him and then live in him in a reality where there is no such thing as condemnation because that's God's judgment. <laughs> Je Jesus said, I know this is chapter 12. I've never heard a preacher preach on this. He said this on Palm Sunday, right before he went to the cross. He said, I know that the Father's commandment is eternal life. Life is a communion of sacrificial love. That's the condemnation of condemnation. So eternal life must be the eternal condemnation of condemnation. Verse 3. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned the sin in the flesh so that the just or the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those being or existing according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For the mind of the flesh, literally translated, the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind of the flesh is hostile to God. Remember who is love. It does not submit to God's law. His, his law is love. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, we've already spoken about the flesh quite a bit. So let me just remind you, the problem with the flesh is not simply that it's physical. I mean, the Bible claims that we're going to a new Jerusalem, that we are a new Jerusalem, that the new Jerusalem is a bride, and heaven is somehow a wedding banquet, which in that day also implied a honeymoon with food and wine and streets made of gold. So the problem with the flesh isn't that it's physical, but that it's isolated. Lonely as hell and dead, dead and dying. 
my flesh only feels its own pleasure. It only feels its own pain, except, except for one or two sacramental exceptions. We've spoken about the flesh, but now Paul starts talking about the spirit, and at this point, it's almost impossible to keep talking. We love to talk about the gifts of the spirit, right? Why? Well, because they're tangible. We can judge them. And we love to talk about the fruit of the spirit because we can pick fruit and claim it as our own. You impressed with my love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness? But the spirit is almost impossible to contain in a word. It blows where it wills, and we know not whence it cometh or whither it goes. In a previous message, we referred to it as the eye that observes me. And we noted that we can't really even find it in space and time. The observer, the, the eye. The moment you think you have observed the observer, the observer has become the observed, which is your image of the observer in space and time. In other words, the, the moment that, that I, uh, observe I, I has become me. So if, if I look in a mirror, I don't see I. I, I see me. I do not actually exist in space and time. So I don't really know what I am, although I constantly confuse I with me. Me, myself, exists in space and time, but I am of another reality. And to make matters worse, neither Greek nor Hebrew have capital letters, and Paul doesn't seem to think it matters. Most English Bibles will include a footnote in chapter 8, several different places in reference to the word spirit, noting that the translator doesn't really know whether or not spirit should be capitalized. In other words, they don't know if Paul is talking about God's spirit or our spirit, or maybe both. And to make matters even worse, in some of Paul's writings, he claims that there is only one spirit. And in 1 Corinthians, he claims that he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him, and we know that his spirit is the Holy Spirit. And to complicate matters even further, spirit, ruach or neshama in Hebrew, or pneuma in Greek, spirit is also translated breath. And the thing that makes you conscious at all, or human at all, is that on the sixth day of creation, which is today, God took some dust and breathed his breath, his spirit, into that dust, and you became a living soul, a nephesh in Hebrew, a psyche in Greek, which is sometimes translated life. Jesus said that you have to lose your psyche to find it. And he who seeks to save his psyche or his life or his soul will lose it. And that's a bit surprising because religion often seems to say, we'll give you some knowledge of good and evil so you can save your psyche and never lose it. Save your, save your life and never die. That is, save your soul from the judgment of God. Verse 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit since... The Spirit, the breath of God, dwells in you. And then Jew would say, well, of course the breath of God dwells in me. If it didn't dwell in me, I wouldn't be me. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Now, you can't help but notice that Paul distinguishes between the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ as if they were two, and yet, in reality, we know that they are one. So it's worth pondering the fact that every soul has, or at least had, the Spirit of God. But Paul talks as if some may not have the Spirit of Christ, or at least the living, moving Spirit of Christ. So perhaps, perhaps, the Spirit of God is like entombed in every human heart. 
and moves. It begins to move when the curtain is ripped and the spirit rises and descends and descends and rises like, you know, breath in our lungs. On the cross, Jesus breathed his last and delivered up his spirit. And at that, at that moment, the curtain in the temple separating the inner tent from the outer temple, it ripped from top to bottom as if something got in and something got out, or maybe both. <sighs> and it's at that moment, at the edge of time and eternity, it's at that moment that we say a person is born again, born from above which can also be translated begotten from above. You know, just before John records Jesus saying to Nicodemus, you must be born anothen, again, or from above. You must be begotten from above. Just before John records Jesus saying that, he writes that Jesus is the only begotten. The only begotten Son of God, or only born Son of God. So when Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be begotten from above or born from above, he seems to also be saying, you must be me. <laughs> because he's the only begotten. And that's really wild in light of the fact that Paul writes to the Galatians saying this, how I am in travail with you until Christ be formed within you. Paul talks as if Jesus really is the promised seed. That's sperma in Greek. Paul talks as if Jesus really is the promised seed and that through his death, he impregnated us, his church, who is his bride and who is his mother. He impregnated us with himself. He talks as if at that moment, his spirit became one spirit with our spirit, which is somehow God's spirit, such that my old me has now become pregnant with a new me that is also Jesus's me, and that me is growing. And it's fixing to be born. And he talks as if through his resurrection, each of us is born with him. You know that Paul refers to Jesus as the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn of many brothers and sisters, and the firstborn of all creation. So none of us are finished, none of us are born uh, before Jesus is born, and somehow all creation is born in, of, and through Jesus. That, I mean, that's all just taking the Bible literally, okay? And, and check this out, that's the judgment of God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and God saw everything, everything that he had made with his word, and look, behold, it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. It was the Sabbath, God's Sabbath, God's rest, the endless seventh day, the eternal judgment of God, everything good, and it is finished. Well, back to our text, verse 9. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though your body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And now remember that faith is reckoned as righteousness because it is. So the spirit is life because of the righteousness of faith. That is, the breath is life because of faith. You know, it takes faith to breathe, doesn't it? To breathe is to expire. As in, it's from, I think it comes from Latin, as in to surrender your spiritus, ex spiritus, the breath, the wind, and, and then inspire, as in receive the spiritus, the spirit, the breath, the wind. It, it's rather shocking when you see it, but in all of Scripture, Jesus is the first Adam, the first man said to consciously surrender his spirit. It's recorded in all four Gospels. He did it on the tree in the garden, and it was at that moment that the curtain in the temple that turns out to be us ripped from the top to the bottom, and something got in, and something got out. <sighs> Until that point, all of Adam had been holding his breath, and the breath is the life. Adam must have thought it was his own life. <gasps> but 
the breath is life and the life is in the blood like breath is in the blood. Well, you cannot live if you won't breathe. Unless, of course, you're a baby in a womb. A baby in a womb receives the breath in the blood that crumbs through a, a cord, a cord made of flesh, and it's actually baby flesh. It's the same uh, g genetics. The, the, the cord, you know, is called the umbilical cord. And think about it, to a baby, the umbilical cord would be the most important thing in all the world, and yet mouth, lungs, lips, that would all seem pointless, superfluous. And that's all rather interesting. For we receive the spirit in the blood that comes from the tree whenever we take communion. And it's the blood from the mercy seat on top of the ark in the inner tent of the temple that is you. One night a few years ago, at the end of the sermon up at the sanctuary in the, in the foothills, at Sanctuary Foothills, I, I had everyone close their eyes and just meditate for a moment before we took communion. After this sermon, Susan was like agitated. She pulled me aside. She said, Peter, you won't believe what I saw. I don't know if my eyes were open or closed, but I looked up at the cross and I saw Jesus there. And I saw an umbilical cord coming out of his navel. And the umbilical cord ran to me and my navel. As he's hanging there on the cross, a cord from him to me, and then she said, and then I did close my eyes, and when I opened them, I saw myself as an infant in his arms. See, there's spirit in the blood. There's life in the blood. It's eternal life. That means it comes from another age. It comes from another reality, another world. To be born into that other age and that other world is to lose this world and to be cut from that cord. Not the breath that's in the blood or, or the blood that's in the cord, but the cord that's made of flesh, which you once thought was the most important thing in your world. It's kind of like your body, you know, right now. It must be cut. It must be judged thrown in the trash or burned in an oven. Jeremiah prophesies a day, this is amazing, prophesies a day when no one will even mention the ark that was kept in the tent in, in the temple. And you know, it's rather surprising, but not one of my children ever mentions their umbilical cord. They just stare at their navel and don't even mention it. Verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, your bodies of death also through his spirit that dwells in you. So your old mortal body is condemned and yet only to be made new. The old temple of stone is condemned but only because it is made new. It will be made new. I mean, maybe even the ark is made new and we'll just call him Jesus, maybe. Maybe. The body of death is condemned, but only because it will live, just like a lie is condemned, but only because it's transformed by the truth, like a shadow is condemned when it's filled with the light, like, like sin is condemned when it's filled with grace, like I am not is condemned when filled with I am that I am. Verse 12, so then, brothers and sisters, we're debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, constantly, you know, trying to save yourself and justify yourself, you literally are about to die. But if by the spirit, the, the spirit of what? Spirit of love, you put to death the deeds of the body, which is a body of death, you will live. You see, it's not as if old Adam and his world is not condemned. It's just that I don't need to condemn it. I just need to see that it's already been condemned. There's no condemnation for something that's already condemned. God condemns sin in the flesh in the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's why Paul told us in chapter 6 to consider ourselves, what, dead to sin and alive to God in, in Christ Jesus. You don't need to kill something that's already dead. In the same way, I don't need to defend myself. <laughs> I don't need to justify myself, condemn myself, or punish myself. 
I just need to forget myself. <laughs> like I forgot my umbilical cord. I honestly never think of it. And how do I do that? How do I forget that? How do I lose myself in my vortex of justification, condemnation, and abject fear? Verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption, huiothesius. That's two words in Greek, huios and tithemi, to place. The RSV translate the word, translates the word as sonship, spirit of sonship. When the prodigal son returned, remember in the story, he was put into his place as a son, and yet he had been the father's biological son the whole story. In the same way, Paul tells the Athenians that we are all God's offspring. His genos, his genetics, his begotten, which is really astounding considering the fact that John claims that Jesus is the only begotten, the monogenes, which clearly implies that when we come home to Jesus, we come home to ourselves. And everyone that's anyone, including our dad. Verse 15. <laughs> When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit, the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit, that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Remember, he inherits what? All things. Joint heirs, since, the word should be translated since, iper, as it was translated before, since we suffer with him, simposco, literally suffer passion with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Do you understand? Thursday morning, 3.30 a.m., I'm lying awake in bed, trapped in a vortex of condemnation, condemning myself or condemning myself, terrified that judgment is coming, Sunday's coming, and I'm going to have to preach on the fact that anyone in Christ, for anyone in Christ, there's no condemnation. Thursday morning, 3.30 a.m., when the accuser was breathing down my neck, whispering, you are not worthy to preach the gospel, and I believe that's what he was doing. Thursday morning, 3.30 a.m., I remembered the gospel that we're called to preach, so Thursday morning, 3.30 a.m., I just cried out, Dad, help me. And something happened. I passed through judgment and entered the innermost tent. Just by speaking the word Daddy, I became a child and entered the kingdom and was delivered from a vortex of condemnation. Something was lost and something was found. A new psyche was found, or perhaps I should say was born and you see, when I'm born of this place, of that place, I don't need the flesh, for I breathe the Spirit. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, wrote Paul in 2 Corinthians 5. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The true me is actually born of a false me that doesn't actually exist and can't hold anything together. So a me that cannot be condemned is born of a me that is already condemned, born into a reality that is eternal. I entered this tent, and, 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 I, and I tell you, tell you what, I still must enter the tent day by day, day after day, until everything is in the tent or until everything is born of the tent. I don't even know exactly how to express it. Maybe that's because we're getting close to the center. We're getting close to e e eternity. But I do know this. It hurts to die. And we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks. It also hurts to be born. So Paul writes, if we suffer the passion with him, 
we will also be glorified with him. Firstborn from the dead, firstborn of all creation, firstborn of many brothers and sisters. Next verse, verse 18. I consider that the sufferings, passions of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, huiothesia, sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope, in this hope, we were saved, sozo. In this hope, we were delivered. <laughs> and now we're out of time. So I'll end with, I'll end with this. Several years ago, I used to regularly stop at this particular Conoco station on my way up to Lookout Mountain Community Church where, where I worked at the time. Over time, I got to know the young clerk behind the counter. I remember he disappeared for a few days and then one day I walked in to find balloons and streamers and a picture of a young woman, a rather, rather chunky young woman and a brand new uh, baby, a baby and my friend behind the counter just smiling ear to ear. And I remember I looked at him and said, what happened? And he said, dude, good news. My girlfriend, I think he said girlfriend, might have been wife, he said, my girlfriend had a baby. And I said, dude, I didn't know she was pregnant. He said, dude, I didn't know she was either. <laughs> then he explained a few days ago, we ordered a pizza, and then she started having these, you know, like really bad pains, like deep down in her abdomen. We thought maybe she was having, you know, an appendicitis or a bowel obstruction. We thought it was, you know, like a really bad turd. We thought maybe she was dying, so I drove her. I drove her like crazy to the emergency room, and, and then I sat waiting there in the emergency room for the doctor's judgment. I mean, wondering, would she live or would she die? The doctor came out and said, well, she's not dying, but... The two of you, you're having a baby. And so he stood there at the Conoco, not a widower in mourning, but a proud new daddy who could not wait to show me pictures of his brand new adorable baby. His girlfriend didn't die, but his old world, oh, it did die. He lost his old world and found a new world the moment he heard the good news. He lost his psyche, and he found it. People sometimes ask, what difference does the good news make? What difference does the gospel make? Well, I'm not the only one that stresses out at four in the morning, am I? And what if in a moment of stress, failure, and great suffering, s someone told you, um, you're not dying, you're being born. <laughs> and what if you actually believed it? Maybe in this hope, you would be delivered. We've been asking, how do I get from the old man to the new man, from Mises to Jesus? How do we deal with the hot mess that I am right now, you know, in between? We said that we needed to present that hotness, hot mess to, to judgment, and that's true. Something must die, but this is also true. Something is being born. Can you see it? I don't know if it shows up there very well, but there's a little inner man inside of that outer man, the old man. So what's wrong with you? Look around. What's wrong with the people in this room? I mean, what seriously is wrong with them? What's the reason for all the stress, failure, and suffering in you and those around you? Well, what if you learned that you were pregnant? And so is everyone around you. What's wrong might actually become what's right, and you might surrender control and in this hope be delivered. And what if you learned that you were all, that we were all, about to be born? 
Well, you might just lose your psyche and find it. We'll have to talk about all of this more in the near future. But for uh, right now, in this moment, in this womb of a world, Jesus took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. In the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant. I remember when people get married, they form a covenant. But He said, this is the covenant in, in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And then he said, drink of it, all of you. The breath is in the blood. But before you know it, you'll be breathing that breath in a new creation. And in this hope, we are delivered. So sorry um, that this message, last message, sometimes they feel really dense, right? Like there's a lot going on. And I, I hope you see it's because I think God wants to change our, our paradigm. And, and what I'm, I'm saying really in some ways can be rather simple. So this is it really quickly. Don't sit down. This is my point. You will be judged, but not by Judge Judy, not by Clarence Thomas or Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You will be judged and have already been judged by your Creator. And this is his judgment. You must be born again. You must be begotten from above. And you must be born from above. The only place safe from that judgment is hell. But it's only safe for a time. For even there, the judgment of God will find you. As Isaiah said, even the earth will give birth to the dead. The Raphaim in Hebrew should be translated the ghosts. <laughs> but you don't have to wait till then. <laughs> you can believe the gospel now. So that's the benediction. In the name of Jesus, believe the gospel. Amen.